So welcome to today's coffee conversation, uh, Worlds Without End, is the exhibition that recently opened only online um, on the 1st of October. Um, it was originally due to open on the 30th of April uh, this year, uh, but obviously our gallery is closed due to the pandemic and are still closed for the foreseeable future. So I'm going to give you an overview today of the show and the works in the exhibition um, and then we can have a chat about it at the end. Um, so to begin, uh, here's one of the install shots of our lovely exhibition that no one's seen yet. <laughs> um, and it's curated by the head of exhibitions, Michael Dempsey, and Sarah Reisman, who's the artistic director of the Shelley and Donald Rubin Foundation in New York. So she runs the eighth floor gallery. Um, and this exhibition actually stems from revolutions from Without, which was a show by Sarah Reisman in New York. And Michael Dempsey and Barbara Dawson visited this show back in 2019. Um, and it kind of, it was talking about borders and it was opening up new conversations and how artists were responding to this. And they thought it was very relevant that it should be shown in Ireland, but instead of bringing the entire show over and showing, showing the same works, it was adapted to fit within the European um, and Irish context. So the exhibition focus, um, when the curators first started talking about this back in 2019, uh, was Trump's America was basically the kind of, so the US side of things and what Sarah was dealing with. And then the UK and Ireland and dealing with Brexit and the border, uh, the border question basically, um, as well as the mindset that's created by border fortification. So they were kind of the, the core themes of the exhibition um, at the start. Um, and then the pandemic happened. And um, obviously a pandemic doesn't respect borders. Um, and it took away any utopian sense that we had before of a world without borders. Um, so our travel has become restricted and we began to work from home. Countries closed down their borders. Um, and then all of a sudden the, the whole ideas and context of the show and the works that um, were chosen, their whole meaning began to change as well. And we, the curators began to see the works in a different way, as well as what they planned originally. So what we have is 12 um, artists in this exhibition, uh, Irish and international. Um, so we stem from 1980s Ireland and we go all the way through to uh, today in Svalbard. Um, and we reach different countries and how artists are responding to the border question, um, the effects that borders have on individuals and communities, um, and the positions of privilege and human rights issues. So um, quite very strong um, subjects, but um, I'm just going to give you then a brief overview of all of the works. Um, you'll also notice that uh, the walls, so here we'll have a red wall, but throughout the exhibition we've used red, orange and yellow. Um, and this references a terror alert system that was in the US. Um, and when we reach the work of Tony Cox, I'll be able to go into this in more detail. Um, you also see recurring themes of remembering uh, the effects of conflict and war and surveillance as kind of that kind of continues through each of the works in the show. Uh, the title can have biblical connotations. Um, it has been used in numerous science fiction novels and films, but it also reflects on a constant state of repetition in history. Time and time again, there seems to be no progress. And we see this in the news every day. So this concept will be explored for the, further in the exhibition. So we'll begin with uh, the Irish artist, uh, John Byrne, and we start at the Irish border. So we have two artists in this exhibition that deal with the theme of the Irish border. Um, extremely relevant today as well, uh, as we're still talking about it. Um, 
we have John Byrne and then later on I'll talk about Dermot Seymour who has two paintings in the show. Um, so what we have here is an archive of a performance that happened in 2000. So this would have been two years after the Good Friday Agreement um, was signed, um, but it was also in celebration of the new millennium. Um, so John uh, Byrne creates quite satirical works um, and this is a response to the northern and southern border after years of conflict. Much of Byrne's works relate very specifically to his experience of growing up during the Troubles. In his art practice, Byrne ex examines issues from a comic perspective, reducing monuments of political, religious and cultural division to the ridiculous. Byrne is a native of Belfast and lives and works in Dublin at the moment. So as a performance artist, he worked throughout Ireland and Europe, and then he returned back to Ireland in the 1990s, um, where he performed a border warrior in 97. And then this work called the Border Interpretative Centre opened up, um, or um, occurred afterwards and was inspired by that. So, um, Byrne obtained the use of a small um, uh, kind of cottage that was on the border um, on the main road between Dublin and Belfast. And he decided to create like a visitor center. So the center um, had the border neon above it to illuminate where it was. Um, and this can be seen here. I don't know if you can see my um, mouse, but this is the border sign here that's been propped against the wall, uh, no longer illuminated, but again, it's still uh, being discussed, unfortunately. Um, so inside the visitor center, he also had a shop that was stocked with border paraphernalia. So in for this archive, as part of the shop, we had this um, number of shelves that he's recreated all of the paraphernalia that he sold at the time. And you can actually um, buy this when you come into the Hugh Lane, if you want to buy um, a watchtower that he's uh, painted himself. Um, so you have souvenirs and gifts, including ceramic miniature British Army watchtowers, uh, wishing good luck from the border, sticks of border, um, candy rock, uh, books on the border. He's got T-shirts and you've got, you can even take away your own sample of the border um, itself. And he has a selection of postcards. Uh, one even reads castles of the border across the center. And it would seem from when you first look at it, it's like this quaint little village and then in the background you see four British army hill forts. Um, then this poster here, this would have been um, on a billboard um, just before you reached uh, the border centre. Um, and here is actually the artist with his two children at the time, um, was the, still his children, but they're much younger. <laughs> um, and uh, they are kind of using the fields that would have once been overlooked by the, the watchtowers and the menacing helicopters overhead. So at the time of this performance was recorded, uh, the borders, geological history and people. So what I'm going to show you now is um, a little documentary video that uh, John Byrne created for the day um, of how it, it was on the news and um, how uh, the opening went for that uh, time. So you can actually watch this on YouTube uh, afterwards, but I'm just going to show you a clip now. about the Border Interpretive Centre? Well, I'm, I'm very proud. I'm, I'm the director of this uh, new centre about to be opened here. It's a very proud day for me, and I think it's a proud day for the whole country. Uh, we're surrounded by the border here. It's an ideal spot right on the border. There's a border there. I've travelled, and I've seen a lot of borders, and many of them much bigger than our own. But I have to say that, uh, you know, at the, at the risk of sounding... Uh, a kind of partisan. I think our border is the best, you know, uh, even though it's small, it, it's got a history to it, and it's something that uh, I think unites the whole country. I know the word 
like has been used over and over again, but I, I can't find a, a better description of this occasion. And it's good to see such a good turnout here today. Okay, so without further ado, I'll just pass you over to Kevin. Thank you very much. Uh, John here and, and his hard working team has just done a, a fantastic job to, to get this place off the ground. And uh, I think uh, it's, it's nine million pounds very well spent. And now it gives me great pleasure and pride to declare the Border and Trade Centre well and truly open. Thank you very much. That's just a snippet from the video there. So it was a successful opening, as you can see. Um, and he actually had a local comedian um, open the centre um, and did have some initial success. Uh, but unfortunately, due to um, that the, the centre needed to run on a diesel generator uh, for power and the damp weather, it unfortunately had to close. Um, so now it no longer exists. Uh, but in that video, you can see all the merch that you can now buy and that's on sale um, in the shop. So um, Bern has commented on his work uh, saying his existence, although short-lived, was proof that peace had arrived to a location previously intolerant to satire. So yet looking at this work and it does have a um, very humorous side to it, um, we're looking at this archive 20 years later now and it feels more relevant than ever. Uh, Brexit has reminded everyone who is who, where is where, north or south, and the troubles, and a hard or soft border, what does that actually mean? Since Brexit was announced, major anxieties have been created for bordering towns and communities. Brexit that has no plan was forced on, forged on misinformation, and now we edge closer to December 31st, out of their transition stage and into the unknown. So we're reminded of our past and the violence and fear that could easily be reignited. So it's this idea of like remembering and, and how art has a, a focus on this and how it's, um, we should be learning from the past, but yet we're still talking about this. So um, moving into the exhibition. So I'm gonna be walking through as if we're kind of walking through the show, um, uh, but we're doing it virtually. Uh, so this is Rax Media Collective. And it's a collective that were formed in uh, 1992. There's three members um, and they live in New Delhi in India. And the word Rax in the group's name has two meanings. In Persian and Arabic, Rax refers to a whirling state of meditation, but it's also an acronym for rarely asked questions. Um, so their early practice was focused on uh, documentary making um, but then they soon started to merge the role of the artist the curator educators and writers to create um, their artworks um, and in this show we have undoing walls which is an animation loop and it's a real it's a fantastic piece and I really get hope you have the chance to see it it's a beautiful animation um, unfortunately I couldn't find an example to show you online but it's a continually changing kind of graphic and shape-shifting kind of forms of architecture almost seems like um or like a fluttering kind of textile um but very abstract but it it, it explores and inverts the idea of international boundaries and borders so there's an ancient idea indian concept for city planning called vastu shastra and this incorporates Hindu and Buddhist beliefs within ancient city planning. Uh, this is a collection of ideas and concepts that are not rigid and can be adapted. And this is kind of like a new way that we could be looking at walls and borders, but it's, it's an ancient concept that has been there for a very long time. Um, and during the colonial construction era in India, Vastu Shastra was widely ignored, but this does open up new ways of thinking about what a border can be, especially now that we are spending more time at home within the border of our four walls. This animation explores new concepts and perhaps opens the idea of revisiting ancient ideas of borders and how 
the layout or architecture affects our psyche and our mindfulness. And this also um, brings to mind uh, Hugh Campbell's essay that you can read on our online catalog that's available on our website. Uh, Hugh Campbell is the Dean of Architecture um, and in it he talks about the um, how borders and home have kind of merged and since the start of COVID and, he, and how this affects us physically and mentally. So the domestic boundary so fundamental to our society and ourselves was comprehensively breached. What has been carefully kept out was necessarily let back in and we are re-evaluating our spaces. So I think it's a good way, a great kind of abstract work to kind of start the conversation and, and look at where we are right now and, and how, you know, we're sitting in our homes, but I'm also in work and how these kind of merge and, and how we deal with that now as well. So then we move into uh, uh, another projection, uh, which is Ari Marcopolis. Um, and um, maybe if you're wondering what this dome is, this is a sound dome. So this is, um, when you stand under it, it's the, the person can experience the, um, the sound of the work in that particular area rather than it bleeding into the space. So uh, Ari Makopoulos was born in Amsterdam. He's an artist, filmmaker and self-taught photographer. Um, and he moved to New York City in 1980 and he still lives and works there now today. Uh, when he first arrived in New York, he was hired as the uh, printing assistant to Andy Warhol. Um, which he also credits him to teaching him the value of photography um, and photographing everyday objects and people. And he is also most well known for showcasing elusive subcultures, um, including artists and snowboarders and, and skaters, um, musicians, hip hop artists and working with other fashion labels. So this piece is called The Park. It's from 2017. Um, and Ari actually went to this park. It's in Fort Greene in Brooklyn. Um, and he set up his camera and he just left it. And he, he was like, uh, chose just a random day and was like, hey, today's the day. And he's, I'm just going to see what happens when I, and I set it up. And I think it's a nearly, nearly an hour long um, video piece. Um, and what we see is the dynamics of public parks and how they function within communities. And we have an unfenced basketball court where you see the lives of the New Yorkers um, walking past. You have a game of basketball happening. And it's also near the Walt Whitman housing project that is part of the Fort Greene area. Um, I think this work also highlights the kind of stark differences that are in Brooklyn at the moment, which is experiencing a very high um, kind of gentrification um, rate at the moment. And, but there's also pockets of extremely poor and, and that would be in the, the Fort Whitman housing projects as well. And they're almost kind of just being left and, and becoming dilapidated and people are living in really poor conditions. Um, so should, there's this real kind of like, barrier between these two kind of communities that's being created from this. Um, and the, the work is also accompanied by a soundtrack by a pianist and composer, Jason Moran. And he has, uh, it's a jazz piano piece with an improvised piano soundtrack um, that spontaneously translates the visual rhythms of the park. Um, so he responded to this work when it was shown in Japan and uh, it was recorded live and he, this is what we hear with the piece in the show. Uh, he's also referencing the story of American jazz pianist and composer Thelonious Monk, who would have been around from the 1940s to 1970s and was from the area as well. Um, obviously when the curators chose this piece uh, for display, uh, our viewing or perception of this work has changed and, and since the start of the pandemic. And here we see people walking through and, and interacting with one another and not wearing masks. And it's kind of like now this foreign place that, you know, 
that seems like a, an age ago that we were allowed to do this um, sort, sort of interaction with other people. Um, so it just sh shows how works can change and depending on kind of what is going on at the time. Um, so then we move into the, the main gallery space, uh, or the, the largest gallery space, um, and we have a number of works in this area. So yes. uh, Dragona Urusik, um, who lives in... Uh, so Dragona um, was actually, she was born in the former Yugoslavia, um, and as I said, is now living and working in Dublin. Uh, so Urusik works primarily with image and text and video, for this exhibition, Yurisik de deconstructed the book and material originally conceived for a work titled You, uh, so that's why you, as you can see on the screen, The Lost Country. Um, and we, it consists of, so we have a, a vinyl text piece. Here we have a shelf that contains um, books, um, some perspex uh, frames with photographs and text and a canvas um, map. And so in 1991, Yugoslavia collapsed. With the disappearance of the country, at least 1,500,000 Yugoslavs vanished, like the citizens of Atlantis, into the realm of the imaginary places and people. So the artist began her journey back in 2011 by retracing the footsteps of Rebecca West, who is the author of Black Lamb and Grey Falcon, uh, from 1941. So this is a novel, it's a travelogue of an epic sweep through the former Yugoslavia and its many cultural regions. So using her Rolleiflex camera, uh, the artist followed West's footsteps. So she took a copy of the, the book with her and followed in her footsteps through former Yugoslavia, from which the artist herself was displaced during the 1990s war. Um, but for, for, for Dragona, this became a very personal journey, um, far beyond the photographs um, that we see and, and the material that we see on display. Um, and it's her attempt to answer the universal question about identity in a very personal way. So in the artist's own words, I'm just going to give you an excerpt from the very first paragraph um, of this final text to just give you a sense of where this journey starts. Um, so Dragna describes the beginning of this journey. Uh, the story of me as a photographer begins on the day when our family apartment got burned down together with thousands of prints and negatives my father, an ardent amateur photographer, had accumulated. On that day, I became one of those refugees with no photographs, with no past. Indeed, my memories of the events and people I encountered before that Sunday in September 1991 are either non-existent or very vague. I learned then the power photography has over memory. The day after the fire was the last time my father took a photograph, a perfunctory snapshot to record the damage for the insurance company. Where he stopped, I started. The act of photography, of looking at the world through the camera lens, helped provide a semblance of control over an otherwise unpredictable world. So this is just, again, is another work that just highlights the importance of remembering the past. And you can actually, in fact, if you visit her website, you can see uh, these photographs and the text that accompany them, um, the extremely moving um, images that she took on her journey and the people that she encountered. Um, and then here we have an example of the shelf. So there's a copy of um, the, this is the, the book that she created. So it incorporates photographs and um, then copies of her, um, uh, the Rebecca West novel um, and parts that she's kind of tagged throughout it. Um, so it's really, it's, it's, it's an incredible piece. So it's, it's worth um, reading up on and, um, and hopefully you get to see it in the exhibition as well. So we move to the next piece that's in the gallery space. Um, and this is a banner. So this work is by Chaudelage. Um, and this is a collective from Russia 
founded in 2003 in St. Petersburg. Um, they're a working group. Um, there's quite a few of them in it, but there is a main core group um, that primarily work under this name. And they're a group of artists, critics, philosophers, and writers um, with the goal of merging political theory, art, and activism. So the group's name, Shodalat, recalls the first socialist workers' self-organization in Russia, uh, which revolutionary and politician Vladimir Lenin outlined in his political pamphlet, pamphlet, What is to be done? And that's from 1902. So, um, so for this exhibition, the curators chose this banner. Um, they're also known as educational flags or learning flags. Um, and it's part of an ongoing series um, that uh, this collective produce. Um, their position is both art and objects of street protests. So the flags were first conceived and made as protest banners by collective member Nikolay Olinikov. And he started this back in 2011. Um, so these flags are based on similar banners that would have been used in the Soviet houses of culture, um, also known as palaces of culture. And these would have existed from around the 1920s. And I think there's still some even around today. Um, these are public spaces for workers where stage events for local party and trade union meetings were held. Uh, the traditional banners were intended to greet the members and encourage them to respond openly to the meeting's agenda, decorate a community, and they decorated uh, the gatherings and halls um, that they were displayed in. Um, so this particular banner um, has uh, the words de-schooling, the first word, for schooling, the second word, and the word creolizing. So creolizing occurs with a creole language, which is um, developed from simplifying and the mixing of two different languages and cultures are also merged. Um, it's a term first used by linguists, but um, it can also describe where other cultures um, blend together and, and break down barriers. So this flag was produced along with a, a series of flags also um, that was displayed in the Creative Summit in the Venice Biennale in 2015. And the collective have um, described this as designs that were intended to greet visitors and encourage them to participate in the event's agenda. So you had uh, the Creative Summit um, in Italy and all of the walls, which we'll see now in the next here, they were hung all around the walls for the different um, lectures and workshops that were taking place in this area. And you can see them hanging above the speakers here. And here's just an example of how they were originally used um, also for street protests in Russia as well. Um, so a very powerful piece. This was a work, um, so I, I talked about the Revolutions from Without, which was the exhibition that Sarah Reisman um, curated. Uh, this is one of the flags that they chose um, for display in their exhibition. So then we move on to uh, Elaine Byrne, who's an Irish artist who's based in Dublin, uh, between Dublin and New York, but primarily Dublin at the moment. Um, and she works with uh, multimedia, so that's video and sculpture and photography. Um, and this work was created specifically for the exhibition. Um, so Blazing World explores the mythology surrounding the Arctic archipelago of Svalbard, which is in Norway, as well as its, or close to Norway, as well as its contentious issues of sovereignty. The islands are positioned between mainland Norway and the North Pole and enjoy a unique status defined by the 1920s Svalbard Treaty. So this treaty grants Norway sovereignty over Svalbard with one requirement, that the archipelago and territorial waters remain demilitarized and free economic zone for all 45 signatory states. So that means anyone living in any one of the states can live and work in Svalbard without a visa. However, the treaty was drafted decades before the emergence of contemporary maritime law and the 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zones 
uh, have led to inadequacies and a long running dispute with certain countries. And this would include uh, Russia amongst that. So Bern, uh, Elaine Bern went to Svalbard um, and she recorded, um, she went inside a glacier while she was there um, and recorded the, the town that exists there. Um, and it's an incredibly harsh way of life. Um, so you have minimal hours of daylight and um, you can only keep within certain zones, um, obviously, because then you have polar bears outside of those zones. So it's an extremely dangerous um, area, but you can live there if you, <laughs> if you want to move there. So uh, Burns Sensation created for the exhibition includes three parts. It's a, poli a polished, coal sculpture which you see here which is absolutely stunning in real life it's really beautiful um, and the different lights that it captures um, and it references the mining past of uh, Norway but also the environmental cost that comes with um, coal and coal mining. Here we have a video um, this is a composite video so that means there's multiple there's a lot of excerpts used in this uh, video piece and she's taken from um, all sorts of films and then includes her own um, recording of Svalbard and, and walking through the glacial cave um, so it's um, fan footage extracts from film sets in Svalbard um, and also clips from referencing the idea of hollow earth. So if you haven't heard of hollow, hollow earth, <laughs> um, it's a kind of for a conspiracy theory or um, I don't know who would, it was believed that there is uh, life within our planet um, and at the center of our earth and it can be reached by going through the North Pole. So there's a lot of films and she's taken from like Journey to the Center of the Earth and films from the 40s and 50s and even to present day where people, where certain people can believe that there's a, um, life can exist within and not only that, but there are a species of higher people that exist within our planet. Um, so the title Blazing World um, is referenced to a 17th century book by English writer, Margaret Cavendish. She was the Duchess of Newcastle, who envisaged a utopian kingdom at the center of the world, which could be accessed through the North Pole. This hollow earth's inaccessibility challenges the perceptions of its borders. So it's incredibly, so it's quite, um, a incredible interesting piece um, and the, the way that Elaine has approached it and Borders has been part of her art practice um, where she has used it in her recorded it in previous works and and she's visited very difficult to reach locations where she's gone to visit the US Mexico border the Spain Morocco border and the Greece and Turkey border and at each site, Byrne hones in on both the mundane and spectacular to question the reason for borders and recognizing that economic interests are as much at stake as military security. Um, so there's just a couple of examples of photographs. And again, um, you can see these on uh, her website and um, it's also represented by Kevin Kavner, so you can see the works there. I think she had a, a show there actually called Borderline, um, where which would have had um, a lot of these images. So then uh, we move to Dorgues, or Dorgues, um, who's born in Jerusalem to a Christian Palestinian family, and a, a family of Jewish immigrants from North Africa, um, which was on his father's side. And he shares his time between Jaffa and New York City. Dorgwes produces photography and video installations which explore the relationships between art, narrative and memory, interrogating personal and official accounts of the past. His practice raises questions on contemporary art's role in narr narrating unwritten histories and in recontextualizing visual and written documents. 
So what we have here is uh, three images, but it, the actual work that's on display in the show is actually a slideshow of about 30, 32 images like this, which are projected onto the wall. The work was originally shown as um, on a carousel projector, which is one of those kind of um, old pieces of equipment that you have a slide and it kind of moves around um, and there's a lovely sound that comes with one of those pieces of equipment. Um, but this one is we're showing it as a digital projection because carousel projectors are highly unpredictable <laughs> and they can break down quite easily. So uh, this work is called Bypass and um, it's a series of images of a road trodden daily. Um, and what we see here is you can see kind of the scar of the landscape um, in this dirt track here and it's a road trodden daily by Palestinians leaving their village to go to work in Jerusalem and returning again at the end of the day. So this road navigates around the separation wall. Uh, this daily trek, almost a perfect parallel to the concrete scar of the separation wall, is built from the living footsteps of menial and corralled existences. Um, and this, this path is used by thousands of, of Palestinians that need to just go about their every day um, and, and make a living or have access to health care. Um, so what the artist has done, his directed his gaze downward and watchfully tracking each footstep, a witness to all of those who have walked before him. The work is a testament to the survival of people who find themselves segregated and confined behind built fortifications. So this wall or barrier has had many effects on Palestinians, including reduced freedoms, road closures, loss of land, and increased difficulty in accessing medical and educational services in Israel. They also had restricted access to water sources and numerous economic effects. Um, so it's this extremely powerful piece um, done in a very, very um, subtle, way and even like the pace of the slides it kind of like that pace of walking um and just taking that moment to just reflect on you know what you see um firstly is this very kind of mundane road and then you learn how or why it actually exists then um we now move on to Dermot Seymour so uh this is the other Irish artist who's dealing with the um effects of the northern and southern border in Ireland. Um, so we've got two paintings in the exhibition. Uh, so this first one, um, they're both from the 1980s. Um, and it's interesting to have a piece from the 80s and then look at it and see how relevant this piece is today. So Dermot Seymour uh, was born in Belfast in 1956 and he grew up during the Troubles and his first mature works explored that bizarre, disturbing collision of militarized and ordinary life in both rural and urban settings. And so he's later moved uh, to the Republic of Ireland and he actually, I think he lives in Sligo now. Um, but he adopts in his paintings very um, ultra realistic style of painting. And some have called it uh, surreal um, but he doesn't see his works as surreal um, it, instead Seymour's paintings at the time um, were sometimes labeled as surreal but he was not a surrealist the surrealism was built into the ra reality he was addressing and now we return to that 30 years later um, we also notice in both paintings uh, there are cows and he's used the uh, motif of cows in a lot of his paintings and he's actually revisited um, this motif in um, recent works that he's created this year and he's actually got a show in the Kevin Kavanagh gallery at the moment where he uses the cow motif and he's responding again and this time it's the Brexit question and the upheaval that's been created to, uh, about it and the uncertainty that's been created around it and um, the artist um, comments on why he uses, because we would go, well, why, why is there so many cows? And uh, he said, there are nearly twice as many cows as people on the island of Ireland. And it seems stranger to ignore them than to paint them. And 
when we watched the John Byrne video earlier as well, you'd notice in the background that the fields are full of cows and they are, the, the, the animals in these paintings become the silent witnesses on the lands traversing the border of Northern Ireland. The inscrutable eyes of Seymour's animals make no demands and no statements. They don't intervene with the human drama going on around them. This painting is imbued with complex symbolism. So in this one um, called Arise Great Zimbabwe, we have um, Republican graffiti and a phoenix rising from the ashes. Um, and it's overlooked by, we have in the background here, a helicopter. So again, so the, this is the imagery that we saw in John Burns, and this is reality, or was reality. Um, and we have an unknown man who holds a bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken, KFC Chicken. Um, and this just hints to the great global reach of Ireland's agriculture as the tensions on the border continue. And here um, we have a cow on the abyss. And it's, the it's called the Balcony of the Nation from 1989. And by the late 80s, his Seymour's paintings began to tilt and terrain became steeper and, and harsh and more menacing as the sky opened up above. This subdued cow seems too heavy to be supported by the small amount of rock it stands on, which hangs on the edge of an abyss. So the artist has noted on this work, when you move to the west, you're living on the edge. You become aware of the fragility of the edge. Post-Brexit, the border between the Republic and Northern Ireland has yet again become a contentious issue. And more than 30 years on, this painting is a timely historical reminder. So incredible that we could be looking at these um, paintings in the same way today. Um, and again, it's that re repetition of history and the was without end and, and um, revisiting these. Um, so then we move on to uh, Mark Wallinger. And this is a, uh, another projection piece. Um, he's a British artist and Turner Prize winner. And he's known for his career long engagement with ideas of power, authority and illusion. And he uses epic narratives and lyrical metaphors and where the artist interweaves the mythological, the pol political and the everyday. So this work is quite old as well. This is from 2000. Um, and uh, what we see in it is the slow motion um, of people arriving in London City Airport into the international arrivals. Um, and this is obviously uh, prior to uh, 9 11 and the step up in security that occurred in airports at this time. But Wallinger chose this uh, location because he always felt that airports were problematic and he thoroughly hated the feeling um, that you experienced um, and the mindset that you were putting when you went through an airport. There's always a sense of guilt when you're in security and customs and the anxiousness that he felt when you went through an airport. Um, so he decided to record the arrivals in London City Airport and it's like being released from the airport and this state of mind when you finally get out of there and you're finally released into the world. Um, and Wallinger makes this a com comparison like going to church and the release felt after confession. So it's shot in, um, this actually shot in 1998, I think it was then displayed in 2000, um, before the changes in security response to 9-11. And it's set to misere, which is a 17th century rendition by the Italian composer Gregorio Allegri. Um, and this piece of music that he uses, you can probably find it online to listen to, the setting of the 51st Psalm and has been sung in the Sistine Chapel on Ash Wednesday for centuries. And the music was closely guarded secret until Mozart visited as a 14 year old and he um, made a note of it by memory and then was able to <laughs> recreate it. <laughs> so then everyone had access to it. So it's recorded in a single take 
and we see the opaque electric doors which would have been in the background revealing passengers and flight crews they move into the public arrivals area the work combines religious themes with symbolism relating to national borders the title makes reference to the function of the airport's international arrivals doorway as an entry point to the United Kingdom and creates the impression that these passengers have completed an arduous immigration process and can now enter the heavenly kingdom. And the border guard scene here is almost like representing the role of St. Peter at the, the gates of heaven. So now in, two, in 2020, the UK has left the European Union and extent of freedom of movement for UK resident European citizens, citizens and immigrants still remains unknown. So again, repetition of history. <laughs> um, then uh, we move on to, actually, I might come back to this afterwards. We might go back to, so this is, um, Lawrence Abu Hamdan, and uh, this is a uh, projection and a screen that was constructed in our gallery. And this is a work that really needs to be um, experienced in the gallery. And I, I really do hope you get a chance to come and see it because it's an incredibly moving um, piece. Um, and it's by uh, Lawrence Abu Hamdan, um, who's actually the 2019 Turner Prize winner. And, and if you remember, the Turner Prize of 2019 was uh, won by all four nominated artists, um, which was quite interesting at the time because um, what it meant is that uh, they, they felt like all of their works were dealing with incredibly strong political subjects and why should they be pitted against each other and one is better than the other and instead they should all be just as important because it's the subjects of the work which needs to be highlighted. Um, so um, Lawrence describes himself as a private ear and he works as an artist and audio investigator. So what we see in this piece is um, the importance of uh, or how sound evidence has become incredibly important, um, as important as visual um, and the, the politics of listening. Um, he examines the role of sound and voice within law and human rights. He creates audiovisual installations, lecture performances, audio archives, photography and text, translating in-depth research and investigative work into effective spatial experiences. So this is a steel structure and glass uh, panels and the, the video is projected onto the glass and it's it's to give you the kind of a very um, visual of, get, of sound going through walls and how the projection is going through the glass. Um, so in this exhibition, the work is titled uh, Ward Unwalled and consists of a large glass and steel screen. Um, it's filmed in the soundproof recording studio at Funk House in Berlin. And what you'd see in it is his brother, who's also a musician, is on the drums. And there's this drum beat rhythm that carries you through the three chapters that Lawrence describes in as part of his investigation. So the first chapter, um, Lawrence first talks about um, invisible cosmic particles called muons. And these are actually natural muons that have been developed in the Earth's atmosphere and they can be penetrated uh, in meters deep through layers of concrete. And scientists have actually realized that they can use this um, material and it could be harvested to see through surfaces um, that were previously impervious to X-rays. So muons allowed us to see for the first time into shipping containers and through walls. So that can have multiple implications. The second chapter, um, the artist was approached by Amnesty International to investigate the various prisoner, prisoner testimonies from their experiences in Sednaya prison in Syria. He worked with the research group Forensic Architecture, who are a research agency that are based in Goldsmiths in London. 
and they use uh, various forms of pioneering technology and investigate human rights violations, including violence committed by states, police forces, militaries and corporations. And I'd highly recommend um, looking at their website to see just the amount of um, things they have investigated and the uh, shocking kind of evidence that is actually comes from their investigation. So they uh, invited Lawrence um, to be part of this investigation and to use his experience as a sound artist um, to recreate the sounds um, heard by um, some of the once detainees from these prisons. Sound became one of the essential tools to digitally reconstruct the interior architecture of the prison, interlinking the series of prisoner narratives gathered as evidence for investigating human rights and violations heard or experienced through walls of the blindfolded detainee cells. Since 2011, thousands have died in prisons and detention facilities operated by Syrian government. Tens of thousands of people have been tortured and ill-treated in violation of international law. So in 2016, uh, Lawrence with Amnesty International and Forensic Architecture traveled to Istanbul um, and met with five su survivors from Sidnaya prison. Um, and what uh, Lawrence, from this, instead of becoming the, the victims, they are the victims of, um, of this prison, but they became the expert with, witness because they were blindfolded within each of their cells. So they had no idea what, where they were or what their cell looked like. But what they did is the, the um, sense of hearing was heightened. So it meant that they became um, very acute to different sounds of um, people being tortured, doors opening, what certain guards sounded like, their footsteps. And by using their testimony, they were able to recreate or possibly recreate the inside of the, the walls and, and um, the experiences that um, these detainees were going through. So the former detainees described the cells and other areas of the prison, including stairwells, corridors, moving doors and windows, who would reconstruct the spaces they described. The witnesses also added objects they recalled, from torture tools to blankets and furniture. The recollection sparked more memories as the model developed. Um, and what they first, when they were first uh, talking to them and, you know, they say, oh, I heard a door slam. Lawrence moves away from just your kind of stock image, uh, stock sounds that, you know, oh, here's a door slamming and customizes uh, tools and objects to create the specific sound of and, and how quiet or loud. And um, so it became, once they heard that noise and it did, it would start to ignite other memories uh, that they experienced and it creates a new language of evidence. And then the final chapter of this piece, um, Lawrence recalls the trial of South African athlete Oscar Pistorius and the murder of his girlfriend Reva Steenkamp, who is a 29 year old model and law graduate and it occurred at their home in 2013. And in this we hear part of the uh, court where a witness heard the three gunshots, a neighbour overheard three gunshots on the screen. And it was this evidence that was used against um, Oscar Pistorius um, and uh, how it became, uh, and then from other neighbours as well. And this just shows how important sound witness has become um, and as it becomes to be more developed as well. So I'm going to show you now a, just a clip, just to get a sense of this video. Um, and you can actually watch it. Uh, uh, Lawrence W. Hamden has a YouTube channel um, and you can read up on it in more detail on his website and forensic architecture as well. Um, but again, it's, it's an absolutely fantastic piece to come and once the gallery opens again to, to watch. So just show you an excerpt now.
It was rumored that Danny Lee Kylo grew the best weed in all of Oregon. In the early 90s, his product was famous for coming with strict instructions, smoke only, no baking, no brownies. It was so strong that a single toke produced a strange high, one that could both settle your nerves and heighten your senses. If you smoke just a little too much, you start feeling agoraphobic and claustrophobic at the same time. Kylo's weed found local infamy when a parent reportedly found her teenage son, high as hell, nestled in the corner of the room gibbering, I no longer know what there is behind the wall. I no longer know there is a wall. I no longer know this wall is a wall. I no longer know what a wall is. I no longer know that in my room there are walls. And if there weren't any walls, there would be no room. By 1992, the product had spread from the inner city and permeated deep into the suburbs, catching the attention of the police officers as it wafted outwards. Eventually, the police received a tip-off to Kylo's whereabouts. And one night, as he was attending to his weeds and replacing a bulb in one of his high-intensity heat lamps, the police were outside on a stakeout. With the curtains drawn and no search warrant, nothing unlawful could be detected from the exterior of the property. A year prior to this stakeout, a law was passed that allowed the police to acquire surplus equipment from the military. Assault rifles, Humvees, choppers, boats and sniper scopes began transforming police departments into combat-ready infantry units. And this is how an as-yet unused Ajima Vision 210 thermal imager found its way into the trunk of the unmarked police car outside Kylo's home. Conscious that it would be considered trespassing if they were to set foot inside the boundary of his private property, the officers creeped up as close as they could get, and with their legs pressed against the outer surface of the well-worn, waist-high wooden perimeter, they peered through the viewfinder of the military-grade thermal camera. The exterior wall of Kylo's home appeared to be aflame. The image was saturated with white-hot amorphous blobs that loosely marked the outline of the high-intensity heat lamps beating down on the weeds behind the wall. Kylo was arrested, but it wouldn't be for another 10 years until he received his final verdict. His case went up through the entire court system, eventually ascending to the Supreme Court where Kylo's hot wall became a matter of constitutional magnitude. The debate came down to one seemingly irresolvable technicality. Was the heat that passed through the wall of his home into the air outside public or private property? The contest in court became like that Orson Welles film, the one where Charlton Heston plays a Mexican and has to figure out if a murder in no man's land happened in Mexico or America. Well here the internal fabric of the wall became the grey legal area, not between two nations, between that of public and private space, between the technologies permitted for police work at home and those used by the military abroad. So just because you, the very start of the, the work and then he'll go into the other three chapters, but um, incredibly moving piece, so um, do uh, watch it if you can. So then, oh, to the next slide. So then we moved um, outside uh, into the corridor area, the Hugh Lane, to Tony Cox. And there's two um, video works in the exhibition uh, by Tony. He's an American artist and he brings together color theory, sound, music and text in his works. His films confront the social condition as well as specific prejudices and threats suffered by black subjects. So um, we have two pieces. So the first one here is called Evil 12 Edit B. And in brackets here, we have fear, spectra and fake emotions. So the text in this video is an excerpt from the philosopher and social theorist Brian Usumi, whose 2005 essay called Fear the Spectrum Said, and discusses the politically motivated color coded terror alert implemented by Homeland Security Advisory System in the aftermath of 9-11 under George Bush's administration. According to Masumi, post 9-11 governmentally has molded itself to a threat 
A threat is unknowable. If it were known in its specifics, it wouldn't be a threat. Its future's looming cast a present shadow, and that shadow is fear. This colour-coded um, alert ended in 2011 and has since been replaced by a bulletin system to provide the American public with what the Department of Homeland Security call with more flexibility and timely and useful information regarding terrorist threats to our homeland. So this work highlights the manipulative and irrational fear induced by the former advisory system. And this is the color system that we've used throughout the exhibition. A spike in the color alert quickly regist registered itself as news and it would produce anxiety for reasons that could never be fully understood by the American public. This suggests that the alert system has little to do with warning and is instead a way to calibrate public fear. Like the colours of the alert system itself, fear is felt before it's perceived. We do not feel fear as something else, but rather we feel ourselves being afraid. Colour also has this quality, and we do not so much as come to perceive the colour red as we perceive ourselves reacting to that colour. Um, so it's the extremely so he references all the different kind of the, the colors and what this kind of emotions that come out of um seeing these colors when they were used and then um here we have the other piece called evil 16 torture music and these are four excerpts from the video and uh, this text used in this particular piece is excerpts of the article disco inferno by Mustafa Biyami, and it's featured in the, Nash, the Nation magazine in 2005. And you can actually go and, and Google this and read it. Um, it's an incredibly um, powerful article. Uh, this article discusses how music has become a weapon of war for American forces against Muslim detainees. So Western music from Metallica, Britney Spears, and Barney the Dinosaur had been blasted at definitely high volumes as a method of torturing detainees in Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib, where the unknown torture sites were also referred to as, as the disco. Um, so he also highlights in his text that the power the American forces associate with American culture, so using American um, music against the detainees in order to break them. Um, Biyami also writes that what makes this form of torture insidious is that no visible physical marks of harm are left on the body, while the psychological trauma reverberates acutely long after people leave the disco and detention centre. And a severe post-traumatic stress disorder is not uncommon for survivors. So again, so while you're, so again, we have one of those sound domes that you saw earlier that was used, um, we have them here. Um, and when you stand under this particular piece and it's, it's testament to if you can actually read through the entire piece because you have um, snippets from Britney to Barney the Dinosaur. And after a while it, you can, and you're not even listening to it very loudly. It really does, it starts to get in your head and you can just imagine what this could have been like at the high volumes and you cannot escape it um, and it's just a real horrific um, form of torture that has been used. So the I'm just going to go back now to Leven as uh, this kind of then moves into surveillance, the idea of surveillance and fear that has been induced by the US government. So this uh, final piece is by uh, an artist called Levin Dubok, and he lives and works in Brussels, and he works in various multimedia, uh, from sculpture to performance. Um, and then in 2014, he um, started the studio uh, LB, LDB, which is Studio Levin Dubok. So he collaborates with other artists and practices in re-evaluating his works and how alternative ways of presenting pieces and how the public perceives the work. Um, so this is an installation. So um, it's a sculpture um, on the wall of our uh, gallery. 
and it's a one of those convex mirrors um, that you would see or used to see anyway um, in shops and used in airports and um, as a form of security to see who's in the lo locale. So it uses a convex mirror to make a more complex comment on the expansion of the surveillance state to reflect on the introduction of the Patriot Act and other policy changes that also followed the 9-11 terrorist attacks. So it's called uh, Mirror uh, Number 3 Eagle and it's painted onto the anti-theft mirror. And so what we see here are the symbols embedded on the mirror of the seal of the executive office of the US president. So we have uh, the 13 stars and stripes represent the original British colonies. 13 olives and leaves represent peace. So here. Uh, the left hand on the eagle clutches arrows to represent the need for war to protect the nation. We have this here. The work is a play on scrutiny, security mirrors. It's a, it's a simple surveillance technology installed in everyday spaces like supermarkets, shops, airports, border checkpoints. While in this work, the symbols of the seal obscure the reflective surface um, and in order to track the movement. So that's kind of, that's just a, an overview. I hope that wasn't um, too much uh, detail. But, um, and uh, overview of all of the works in the exhibition. And I just want to highlight also there's there is a curator video. So it's Michael Dempsey and Sarah Reisman who uh, talk about where the show began and how it's developed over uh, these past months um, and uh, how the concepts of the show started. Um, and that's available on our um, homepage, um, along with you can download the catalogue. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's a a essay by Hugh Campbell in it, and um, Rehan Ansari is another writer, um, and also by Michael and Sarah. And you can get an overview of all of the works that are also in the exhibition form as well. So um, we have a lot of information available online um, that hopefully then you can have an opportunity to see the, the work at a later stage. <clears throat> 